What's up, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Believe in Falcons. I'm your host, Will McFadden. We've got a different type of show for you guys today, but it's one that I'm very excited about. I will be joined by Dr. David Chow, who is on Twitter, at ProFootballDoc. Uh, you guys are probably familiar with him, even if you don't know him by name, but he is, is one of the really reputable guys on social media who does diagnose and kind of provide information on injury situations in real time, which is frankly something I have always been way too afraid to do because I am nowhere near a uh, medical expert. So I'm very fortunate to get to talk to one today about Kirk Cousins, his rehabilitation from his Achilles injury. Um, if we've got time at the end, I'm also going to kind of touch on a, a couple of other Falcons who have also been dealing with injury rehab just to see where they are in their progress. Um, Grady Jarrett, kind of first among them. So that is what we have on tap for you guys today. Again, I'm very excited for this one. Be sure to spread the word about this feed. Um, if you have any Falcons fans in your life who are not listening to Believe in Falcons, you need to change that. Let them know where they can find us. If you like to watch uh, podcasts as well, you can check out our YouTube channel, Believe in Falcons. That's where you'll be able to find this video along with many, many more. Um, so it's a great place to kind of Go back through the archives um, and get any of the evergreen content that we have put up, like the position review series, which you can find on YouTube as well. So before we get to Dr. Chow, I want to talk a little bit about Darnell Mooney. Um, I just have a couple of thoughts based on uh, some research that I did on him. I just need to do a, a couple of quick ad reads. The tournament is here. BetOnline is your bracket headquarters for this season with the best bracket contests out there and odds, lines, and info on every game and every round, right up into the national championship. You can access the most up-to-the-minute wagering information anytime from your desktop or your mobile devices, and even track your bracket real-time all the way throughout the tournament. Head to BetOnline today and get in on all the action. Remember to use our promo code BELIEVE, that's B-L-E-A-V, for your 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. BetOnline. The game starts here. We've got a great new sponsor that I'm excited to tell y'all about. I love betting my friends and betting them on anything. Sports games, who's fast. How about who the Falcons are going to be taking uh, in the upcoming NFL draft at number eight? Or maybe they trade. I just had my most recent mock draft come out, which you guys can find on SI.com or check my socials. I've, I've shared it. I actually have the Falcons moving back in the draft and still landing a top defender. Maybe it's a top defender on all of your lists as well. So who knows? If you want to place a bet on it, though, go to Cut. That's what Cut allows me to do. The Cut app is a peer-to-peer -peer social betting platform that's legal in 40 plus states. Cut has customizable odds, tracking capabilities, and an entire social network with group chats, user profiles, and rewards. All payments, no need for Venmo. Use our promo code BELIEVEFALCONS, that's B-L-E-A-V, Falcons for a 10% welcome deposit bonus. Don't forget that promo code cut. Put your money where your mouth is. All right. So as I said up top, I just wanted to talk really quickly about Darnell Mooney. Um, he had his best season in 2021, 140 targets, 81 catches, 1,055 yards, and five total touchdowns. But he regressed the last two seasons. So what happened there? Well, in 2022, the Bears got a new head coach, Matt Eberflus, and they brought in a new offensive coordinator, Luke Getze, who before that was the kind of passing game coordinator for Green Bay, worked a lot with the wide receivers. So it was just kind of a new offense that I do think took Darnell Mooney a little bit of time to get acclimated to. He also sustained an ankle injury 12 games into the season. So it was a shortened season for the third year receiver back in 2022. And then, crucially, in 2023, the Bears trade for DJ Moore, which bumps Darnell Mooney down in the pecking order, and it just didn't really look like he was developing any of the same chemistry with Justin Fields. I don't know if the ankle injury was nagging him at all last season, but his production certainly has slipped a good bit from where it was at its peak in 2021. So the Falcons are obviously buying low here, even though you could say a three-year, $39 million contract with $26 million guaranteed doesn't necessarily sound like uh, buying low. But I do think that they feel that Darnell Mooney's best days could be ahead of him. And if you look at this offense, it's not hard to imagine 
Darnell Mooney slotting into, you know, for lack of a better word, the slot. Um, but he, I'm trying to figure out if he's going to fill more of that Van Jefferson role that Van Jefferson had in LA, or if it's more of kind of a Robert Woods role. Is it what Obadell Beckham Jr. was doing there for a season? That's kind of where, if you look at what Darnell Mooney does best, he ran a 4.38 at the combine, so he's got blistering speed. He is very sudden from the slot and can create separation pretty quickly. And if you're playing off man on him or zone, he can eat up a cushion very, very quickly. He is excellent at making contested leaping catches down the field. So these acrobatic, adjust the ball in the air, make a big play on the boundary. That is something he's going to bring as well. So when you're looking at this offense and how it might all fit together, I think these over routes, these delayed kind of, if you're running a bootleg right, he's maybe that backside option who's kind of coming over and, and just flashes into view of the quarterback, get him the ball. He, in the NFL, has not been as great yards after the catch as he was in college. But with that speed, if you get him some space, you let him catch the ball on the run, he is a threat to uh, definitely pick up a big chunky yardage after that. So my final points here for the Darnell Mooney acquisition is, uh, you know, the versatility he'll bring, the speed that he'll bring are just, the Falcons had the versatility, they didn't have the speed. And that's kind of why they brought in Van Jefferson. But I just feel like Darnell Mooney offers a little bit more of the total package, maybe down the field as a receiver. He does have kind of that springiness that you would like to see. And again, I think that he's going to look a little bit different, be a little bit better in this Falcons offense, being kind of that number two, but maybe at times a number three. And he should complement Drake London in, in a really fun way. So again, not too, too much there. Uh, it was just very cursory information that I, that I had dug into, um, but I just wanted to share my thoughts on Darnell Mooney before we get into my conversation with Dr. Chow, which we'll head to right now. Excited to be joined now by Dr. David Chow, who you guys can find on Twitter at ProFootballDoc. And you can also check out his breakdowns, his analysis of player injuries throughout the NFL over at SixScore.com. That is Sports Injury Central. Sick. Uh, Dr. Chow, thank you so much for uh, taking the time to join me today. Yeah, I'm part of the Believe family. The Sports Injury Central podcast is on Believe all the time, too. I should be first and foremost shouting out all of our Believe Podcast Network uh, family of podcasts. So thank you for that reminder. Um, we're here to talk about Kirk Cousins, his rehabilitation from the Achilles injury that he suffered in week eight of last year. Um, so I was doing a little bit of digging. It it sounds like Kirk Cousins, you know, in his intro press conference. He targeted, you know, week one, should be ready to go, kind of coming back for training camp. Um, and your piece up on sixscore.com, when will Kirk Cousins make Atlanta Falcons debut, has, you know, great insight into just his rehabilitation. But I'll ask you point blank. When will Kirk Cousins make his Falcons debut? Well, I hope he makes his Falcons debut a little bit in the preseason, in the preseason games. But I would be surprised if he does not start week one. That's not to say that his Achilles is absolutely 100 percent. But I would be surprised if he wasn't good enough and able to start and play and play well. And no offense to Kirk Cousins or the Falcons, if you're relying on the run game for Kirk Cousins, that's probably not why you signed him and, and paid him the money. Achilles rehab has been accelerated. Look, uh, the obvious comp is Aaron Rodgers, right? And Aaron Rodgers was week one. And uh, believe it or not, in game when Aaron Rodgers went down, we we do injury analysis, as you said. So it's not injury reporting. And by our eyes, I studied film in the NFL for 17 years with the Chargers where I knew I examined the player on the field, on the sideline, the next day after an MRI, knew exactly what the injury was. And I'd have about half an hour to kill on Mondays before meeting with the GM. <laughs> and I'd go up to the film room. And you know how it works. You work for the Falcons. I went to the film room, and they showed me the TV copy, the sideline copy, coach's film, mm -hmm. the end zone coach's film. And there I knew the answer, but then I got to see the question. Now that I'm mm. not with the team anymore, 
I get the question, which is the video, which is the peripheral information. The answer, look, there's no substitute for examination and looking at an MRI, and we don't do that. That would be a HIPAA violation. Yeah, I'm not treating Kirk Cousins. I'm not right. treating Aaron Rodgers. But by video from study, studying it for 17 years, we can be very clear. And in game, we said Aaron Rodgers tore his Achilles. In game, we said Kirk Cousins tore his Achilles. After the Aaron Rodgers week one game, when Robert Sala said, yeah, it looks like his Achilles, but we're getting an MRI, the usual, the usual <laughs> kind of thing. Yeah, uh, I tweeted out that it's certainly very bad news, but because this is a week one injury and because it's his left front non-push-off foot and because he has a strong arm and because of rehab technology, that it's not impossible for Aaron Rodgers to return to play this season. And I was targeting early playoffs in January. This was the day, the evening that it happened. And uh, obviously Aaron Rodgers tried to push up the timeline <laughs> into late December, didn't quite make it. But, you know, the caveat was the Jets would have to make the playoffs without him. And quite honestly, if they make the okay. playoffs with Zach Wilson, are they going to switch, right? <laughs> and uh, part of it. Now, Kirk Cousins has different than Aaron Rodgers. It's his right Achilles push offside. And so that's a bigger deal for throwing downfield and accuracy. But he actually has more time. Yes, it was a week eight injury, but he's not racing for last season. He's looking at this season which actually gives him net more time. Look, everyone's – the number one question I was asked about Aaron Rodgers on Pat McAfee, will he ever play football again? I'm like, yes. He goes, yeah, but he'll be 40 by the time he returns next year. And my answer was a 40-year-old Aaron Rodgers is still way more mobile coming off an Achilles than a healthy 44-year-old Tom Brady. I mean, you know, I mean, Aaron Rodgers is going to be fine. Now, no one doubts that he's coming back. I don't doubt Kirk Cousins will be fine for week one for Atlanta. Would you say he's absolutely 100% on the Achilles? Maybe not, but well enough to be able to throw a plant, do what he needs to do, and I would be surprised if that weren't the case. Uh, the video of his rehab looks pretty good right now. And barring any setbacks, I think he'll be there. I think you'll see him out there for a good portion of OTAs as he acclimates with the team. They're not going to make him do a whole lot, lot, but I expect training camp, other than perhaps some veteran rest, that he should be good to go. And week one, there will be no doubt that he will start and be ready to go. So that's the good news. Yeah, that's definitely exciting. And I look forward to you know watching him in training camp kind of seeing a, a different type of like i got to watch matt and Ryan by the and way was, the, yeah. the falcons are not dumb they're anticipating the same thing otherwise they wouldn't have paid him the money right oh wouldn't for sure yeah. him the money. and they probably had an idea of where he was at but that's a whole other story if you want to get into it yes i do well let's just go ahead and do it right now so yeah the the investigation into tampering um it, when Kirk Cousins said that he had spoken with Falcons trainers, in your experience um, doing this for 17 years in the league, like what what does that whole process look like when you're in the free agency legal tampering period, which I know is is a newer thing, but how does a team go about clearing somebody medically if if that player's not able to talk to team trainers or things like that? Like it seems like if you're able to talk to an agent or a GM or what have you, that you should also be able to talk to a, a support staff okay. like the training staff. Okay. So here's what I'll say. I'll tell you what I know. And it's based on my 17 years of NFL experience and what we did. I don't want to speak as to what the Falcons did or didn't do, et cetera. But here's the overall take on it. First of all, all of these contracts, all of these agreements are not solid until the ink is on the paper. And the ink is not on the paper until a physical is passed where Kirk Cousins would be examined by the Atlanta Falcons team physician and or athletic trainers. Okay. There was a famous incident, Roger Saffold, years ago, St. Louis Rams offensive lineman with a shoulder issue 
agreed to a contract, then flew out to the Raiders, failed the physical, and the contract never happened. And he ended up signing back with the Rams. So you say, how do teams know? They know and they assume, but they still get the final check. Nothing is final until the ink is on the paper. And who was the uh, linebacker that was, I forget now, that was signing with the 49ers, but then went to the Cowboys? The announcements are out there. He agreed to a contract with the 49ers. Then he followed Zimmer to, to, to the, the Cowboys. Until the ink's on the paper, none of this means anything. And part of that, before the ink is on the paper, is the athletic trainer and or the team physician examining Kirk Cousins before the Falcons commit the money. Now, for the draft picks, it's the opposite, right? You get the physicals at the yeah. combines, and so you already know. But the free agents, you get it after the fact. Now, it is absolutely routine uh, for, in my experience, there were many times where the GM would say to me and or our athletic trainer, find out about player X. If he was a free agent, sometimes he was still on another team, right? And we would call the other team, call peripheral sources to find out. That wasn't against the tampering or whatever. Uh, we did it from a medical vantage point. What potentially is the issue here with the Atlanta Falcons is you're allowed, the team officials are allowed to talk to the agent, but no one's allowed to talk to the player. Okay. So if you want to go by analogy, in theory, it is not illegal for a team to steal another team's signals, Patriots, Bill Belichick, what have you. It is illegal to film the sideline signals. You could take handwritten notes, it wouldn't be illegal. You can make visual memory, it's not illegal. Going to a baseball analogy, it's not illegal to steal the catcher's sign. People for a long time the sec at second base, the runner has done so. But to put a camera in center field and then bang on trash cans or use electronic me methods is illegal. It's not illegal to steal signs. It's not illegal to find out about Kirk Cousins' Achilles. You could ask his agent, you could do this, you could ask the agent supply MRIs and other things, but there is a technical illegality if you're contacting the player. Now, did Kirk Cousins actually speak to the athletic trainer? I don't know. It's possible that he spoke through his agent to the athletic trainer and got information. Mm -hmm. Don't know. So I don't know where the tampering is really going to go. And when you really get down to it, does the league really care about this? I mean, you were just checking a box because what's more damaging to the league and to players agreeing to a contract with Kirk Cousins and the Falcons having to renege or agreeing and having it stick. So sometimes yeah. the big picture comes into play, right? I mean, you don't want this, oh, well, wait, we changed our mind based on the physical. So who knows? Maybe they'll modify the rules. I don't know that it's that big of a deal, but technically it probably, if it happened, it probably meets the rule of tampering. But I mean, you're, you have the legal tamper. I don't know. I think it's more of a, you know, the speed limit 65 and you're you really going to ticket someone for going 67. I don't know. Yeah. If you found the cop that didn't like you. Yeah. Then you might get a ticket for 67. <laughs> but I think that's know. a great, a great analogy though, because in all the, like all of, the examples that you provided there of the different sports, it's like, yeah, you can you can kind of skirt around the rules in creative ways, but we're not going to make it easy on you, right? We're not going to let you just like film the stuff. You can commit it to memory. You can maybe talk about like, but you have to do the work of looking at the the signs, getting them, committing them to memory. Then I mean, it'll be perfectly legal, like, and, and maybe yeah. this is all that happened. It'd right. be perfectly legal for the team through the athletic trainer to ask the agent for medical records and, or how's he doing? And Kirk Cousins to tell his agent that that, that communication's allowed. And so maybe it's that's gotta be the intermediary of the agent. Yeah, and maybe that's what happened. Or maybe Kirk Cousins uh, said, well, instead of going through you, let me just call the athletic trainer and he called him. 
And I, maybe that, maybe, maybe agent was like, correct. I got Kirk on speakerphone right here. Talk to maybe him. Yeah. that that could be true too, right? If the attorney's in the room or the agent's in the room, <laughs> I don't know. So I don't know where the investigation's going to go. I look at this as it happens all the time that you sort of try and find out. Um, it's more of a technicality. The question is, does the league want to public pu- punish the technicality? That I don't know. Yeah, that's that's true. And that's what we are all waiting to see. Um, you mentioned the word setback, though, earlier. And in looking at Kirk Cousins rehabilitation and where he is in the process with Achilles injuries. And I love that you pointed out that, you know, it being his right Achilles, which is his planning foot and the foot he's got to drive off of. Um, is there any period during this rehab where there would be maybe a setback is more likely like when he starts X activity, maybe there's a a one week period there where you're a little bit more worried. The earlier in the process, the more likely the setback. My guess is you've, you've, I'm sure you and all the fans have seen the the tennis court videos of Kirk Cousins. Okay. Uh, I would imagine he's got protection, whether it's significant tape and or some sort of brace as he's doing that. And he was far from a hundred percent, but he looks right on track and he looks fine. Those were seven step drops, man. Those were, those were big drops. <laughs> yeah. And a, and a tennis court on air. And I, I play this game. Well, whenever I see video of someone rehabbing, like I f- have long forgotten at the time, which side Kirk cousins Achilles was, but then I just look at video and go, can I tell? And yeah, I could tell. Okay, so he wasn't a hundred percent, but he was doing fine. Uh, The chances of uh, of setback are relatively low, probably at this point in time, unless. But then again, Will, and I say this as a joke, I don't know how heavy those gold chains are, and I hope he's not rehabbing with those gold chains. (laughs) That's true. Yeah, he's got to he's got to keep those off for a little while. Um, (laughs) How can you tell? Like, what what is the tell for you? Is it truly just like? well, 17 years of experience, you got to have that to really be able to see, or is it something anybody could pick up by just looking at that video? Well, it's hard for me to explain. There's different things that you look at in terms of motion and so forth. And uh, it's, I mean, for example, how does a scout know that this guy's a first round draft pick or a GM? Yeah, Excellent there are some point. metrics of what's their 40 time, but just how they move and how they play. And, and yeah, there are some metrics, but you don't draft people just on metrics, right? Of the three cone drill and whatever. You use them as a guide, but there's still a lot of qualitative analysis that goes on. And I think that's kind of what we do here, too. OK, yeah, that I mean, that that makes a lot of sense. Um, so I, you know, I was just kind of curious because yeah i watched the video and i was like well he looks good but again i'm not a doctor and i'm sure doctor to doctor like just as in the draft it's well, well, gonna that, maybe well, well, this, a little this, bit this is my it, it's happened a lot and people say well he looks good of course he looks good he's a professional athlete number one number two he's putting out the video yeah is an athlete <laughs> ever going to put out a video where he doesn't look good I god mean, i wish that would happen one time that would I be mean, so funny. <laughs> okay, I'll give you an example. Uh, I, I've i met Odell Beckham once at a Super Bowl. He doesn't remember. But I've actually gotten a little bit to be friends with him over time through the magic of Twitter. When he was recovering from his ACL, uh, and he was in since had it, he was going to be with Cincinnati at the time, I guess, right, before he got traded to the Rams, his first in ACL. I, I think I, I saw him on Twitter and said he's doing great and he was on a treadmill running. And I said, yeah, he looks great right now, but A, it's about decelerate, not running, it's about deceleration and cutting and that's not there yet. And B, the video looks a little bit sped up, okay? And he took offense to that and said, I did not speed up this video. And I said, no, no, no. I didn't say you sped up the video. Whatever medium you recorded it on, by the time it translated to Twitter, it looked a little sped up. But we still see the hitch, and it's about decel and cutting. And he said, okay, you're right. Yeah, my deceleration and cutting is not there yet. 
but I'm making progress. So, so he was mad that I was accusing him of cheating on. No, I wasn't. I was just saying it looks sped up. Or, you know, not that he was trying to fool someone. It's just the yeah. different mediums. And from that, we actually developed a little bit of a chatter. So he's a very reasonable, nice guy. And I can understand why he'd be upset if he thought I was accusing him of doing something wrong. But yeah, yeah I do look at these videos and, uh, and uh, it's uh, interesting and fun. I mean, I literally this past weekend spent probably two hours just trying to figure out that exact issue where I was uploading a video out of Premiere Pro to put up on on YouTube and that it just kept messing up the time codes like it was slowing down and speeding up based on just the export well, settings. Well, well, so, well, you're you're way ahead of me. I mean, I was lucky to click on this whatever uh, <laughs> Zoom or StreamYard or whatever link it was <laughs> that you sent me to uh to be on this so that's about all i can do i'm just uh you know backing up odell beckham here as i as i often do you know he and i are close friends as, as well so no <laughs> um so mentioning kind of the deceleration the cutting in terms of odell beckham what would be the next thing for kirk in this rehab so we've seen the straight dropbacks what is the next step in that rehab just become stronger and more dynamic i mean keep working at it I, I like i said it's pretty straightforward the the aaron Rodgers thing by the way and i've spoken about this his quick recovery timeline had nothing to do with the speed bridge technique the speed bridge technique's been around 15 years it's nothing revolutionary or new it's a reasonable technique i did it 15 years ago i stopped doing it because there are other ways but he did work very hard at rehab using what seems to me like blood flow optimization techniques and otherwise because you could hear in his McAfee interviews the machine going off uh, in the background etc and yes it also was his front foot and he's got a strong arm and he doesn't need to push off that side nor step in right he, he has this whipping motion because of that and because you know anyone would say 80 Five percent of Aaron Rodgers is better than anything else the Jets had. They were eager to get him back, right? And so, I think the there's a reason why the Falcons were comfortable paying him the money, and I don't think that's going to be an issue. And last question about Kirk, and then you know, I want to talk about um, just a couple of other players before I let you go. What what's the difference in you know? I may be using this phrase uh, incorrectly, and you can correct me on this, but like the kinetic load of moving around in the pocket, your basic pocket movements versus rolling out, scrambling is obviously it seems like one of those is going to stress your Achilles a little bit more. But but is that true? The biggest stress to your Achilles is eccentric load or surprise movements and change of directions. Let's take Dre Greenlaw. Super Bowl. He was just running into the game and it happened. How did it happen? Because yeah. he was running in a game, then, oh, they're not ready. He backed off and then, oh, they're ready again. And he changed directions, accelerated, and got an unlucky pop. So planned activities aren't going to be a problem for Kirk Cousins. You're going to do a seven step drop on the tennis court, isn't a problem. What's stressing it is you're doing a seven step drop and it turns into a five-step drop, and you're off balance because here comes the defensive end and this, that, the other. That's what happens. If you go back to Aaron Rodgers again, it wasn't that he was old and his Achilles <laughs> uh, tore. It was the fact that Leonard Floyd was on his back as he loaded on that left side, and he tried to push up and get out. So it was his body weight and Leonard Floyd's in that eccentric load. And then people say, well, he couldn't have a torn Achilles because he stood up. Well, yeah, he stood up because he was pissed that he got sacked. And he was like, I'm fine, I stood up, you know, like defiantly. And then as he stood up, he sat down because he goes, yeah, this is not right and I can't take a step. And he sat back down. And so that's the classic surprise eccentric load that you would worry about for injury. But the Falcons aren't going to expose Kirk Cousins to any of that until week one. And by mm -hmm. week one, it's going to be nine plus months from the Achilles, and he should be fine. And believe it or not, 
I have more, way more optimism for Kirk Cousins' return from Achilles than, let's say, J.K. Dobbins. J.K. Dobbins was earlier, but he's a running back. I mean, you know, <laughs> yeah. it's different than a quarterback. And Dobbins still has a chance to be okay, but I'd be more worried about Dobbins than Cousins. Because of the position he plays, I don't think it's that big of a deal. Okay, and, and you reminding me of the Dre Greenlaw injury. Man, that was, oh, that was so brutal. And I, the best way, because this has been in the back of my mind as we ramp back up tennis season um, in my own personal life, but there was a, a moment in a match last weekend where there was a drop shot up at the net and I was at the baseline. And I basically did that exact step that Dre Greenlaw did where I'm like, oh, got to get up there. And I shoot my right leg back and just kind of, you can really feel all of the pressure on your Achilles as you kind of make that really sudden movement, your change of direction, you're starting to sprint off of that. And yeah, I mean, that was my first thought when I saw that Dre Green law. It's like, that could happen to anybody. Yeah, but you know why it didn't happen to you, Will? No offense. Because <laughs> I'm probably not 245 pounds. <laughs> Look, uh, your Achilles tendon, and I say this in the kindest of ways, is not materially that much smaller than Dre Greenlaw's. So as players and people get bigger, faster, stronger, your Achilles tendon, your ACL, doesn't get bigger, thicker that much appreciably. So if he's 250, 245, muscle generating, no offense, way more force than you generate, uh, <laughs> it's, it's, you're, you're putting a, a Formula One engine on your Chevy four-door sedan suspension. Yeah, I, that's what I've, I've long kind of thought. And obviously, I'm, I'm not a doctor. You are. So thank you for clarifying that for me. But yeah, the ligament damages that, or that we've seen injuries over the years, like it just makes sense when you've got all these people focusing on explosive power and generating all of this force that, yeah, you can increase your muscle mass. You can, you know, improve your 40 time, but you can't necessarily make your ligaments stronger or bigger. I mean, you can strengthen them, right? But you can't make them necessarily bigger up. or I mean if if Dre Greenlaw is twice as strong as you or big your his Achilles is not twice as big yeah and I wonder if that's why we see certain players taking you know like Tom Brady saying I'm I'm really working on stretching Pilates like a lot of that stuff instead of just bulk right because I, I do wonder if you see these yeah. players who emphasize the muscle mass and that explosive force like they seem to be the ones a little bit more at risk for some of these injuries as opposed to, you know, you may see somebody who looks less athletic than somebody else, but they may be less prone to injury. Is that fair? Is that accurate? Either that or the avocado ice cream. I say that. <laughs> but no, I mean, the ultimate respect for Tom Brady and I am not uh, denigrating quarterbacks versus running backs, but what Tom Brady is asked to do is not what, your average running back or linebacker is asked to do physically. That's why you can play to the age of 44 and 45. Yeah. Okay. You, can you, can you play linebacker at the age of 45? You can't do it. Can you play right? You can't do it. The, the, the demands on a quarterback are much different. Kirk cousins is not exactly young, but he's still performing at a high level because as long as your, your big thing is some baseline shape, a reasonable arm strength, but more importantly, a quick mind. You know, as reading the defenses, uh, you look at this is always one of the fallacies. People like think about strong arm quarterbacks, Tom Brady or Kirk Cousins. Let's say they th throw the ball 40 times in a game. How many tight window throws do you think Kirk Cousins or Tom Brady make out of 40 passes? I mean, tight window in the NFL, how, like probably 38 of those. No. 32. <laughs> you, well, if you're look, I've asked I've asked, asked Rich Scannon this question this year at the Super Bowl. I asked Donovan McNabb five ten percent max. Oh my God, I'm so bad at this. <laughs> no, no, think about it. If you're throwing into a tight window, you have a small margin of error. Your mm -hmm. interception rate is high. A little bit of wind, a little bit of mistiming, a little bit of a tip ball. The idea is to not ever throw into a tight window. 
throw someone open, know where the coverage is, know where the open guy is. You don't want to throw into a tight window and force it in there. This is where sometimes strong arm quarterbacks get in trouble. Oh, I can get into that tight window. Yeah, and yeah, they true. do three times in a row. But on that fourth time, it's a pick. Whereas Tom Brady, and to some extent Kirk Cousins, knows where to throw it, where to throw them open, where to throw away from danger. And, you know, I tell people all the time, the, where, where should a quarter, quarterback throw the ball to the receiver? Here? No. Depends on where the defender is. If it's a trailing defender, you want him out here. If it's a, it's a defender in front. Maybe it's down at his knees or ankles behind him. Depends mm-hmm. on where the coverage is. Where is the safety? And, and ideally, where is the yak, right? I mean, so yeah. tight window throws is not how quarterbacks should live. I've been watching too much of Desmond Ritter, um, so I, I uh, got that question <laughs> wrong, but <laughs> I appreciate the, uh, the insight and the lesson there. Let's wrap this up with just two other Falcons players who I want to ask you about. The first being Kyle Pitts. And, you know, initially we thought MCL injury, but learned kind of after the season that it may have been a little more complicated than that. A lot of people here in Atlanta felt that, you know, Kyle Pitts's lack of dominance last year did have a lot to do with that lingering injury effect. What did you see from the uh, Falcons tight end? When it happened, we said this was multi-ligament injury. Go back to Sports Injury Central. Look, the Falcons weren't lying when they said there was an MCL. The MCL was involved. It was MCL plus what? MCL plus PCL. He had surgery on it. Typically, you don't do surgery on an MCL. We do do surgery on multi-ligament. So, Sports Injury Central, we put a six score, and for the season coming in, like for fantasy purposes, we were pretty pessimistic on Kyle Pitts, and he had a season that reflected that. The good news is it's something that he can recover from, and we're expecting more. So what we do is give injury analysis as opposed to injury reporting, and every team does it in different ways. Coach speak, what's for public consumption and what the reality is, right? And, uh, and the truth usually comes out. Kyle Pitts was clearly more than just an MCL. And I take that as a positive, which means he's got more upside coming, right? As opposed to this is just what he is. He's not that good. Interesting. Okay, so you're you're saying that because he was maybe dealing with more than, than we thought, that you look at, okay, like that makes more sense that he did struggle the way that he did as opposed to just, Man, maybe maybe it's mental. Well, like some let's, guys when they come back from let's that take injury. Another example, yeah. random guy. Saquon Barkley coming mm-hmm. off his ACL. We said fade him. The first year back is not going to be great. So fantasy people that drafted him and he tore his ACL, didn't like him. Drafted him again, and now he has a down year, didn't like him. Coming into the pre the next season, we loved him. A expectations were low, and he did very well, right? So the the uh, if you're a Kyle Pitts fan, don't get off of him yet. I mean, give him a, give him this season here, okay? I mean, this may be a good comeback. I think people jumped off the Kyle Pitts fantasy bandwagon a long time ago. Oh my god, he's like public enemy number one in fantasy circles. Well, but but here's the thing: like clearly, he's no longer you know tight end, you know whatever. Uh, you yeah, want to three, four, right? Yeah, he's. But at some point, he's a value, right? I mean, and sure. uh, I think Kyle Pitts will have a better year than people think. Awesome. I love it. A buy low, a buy low uh, pitch right here on the, uh, on the pod for Kyle Pitts. Keep that in the back of your minds for fantasy football season. Last one for you, Dr. Chow. And I, again, I really appreciate your time. Um, Grady Jarrett ironically suffered his ACL injury the same week Kirk Cousins sustained his um, Achilles injury. This Grady will be 31 coming up in next season. He does not have a an extensive injury history. Do you think it, you know, assuming that this really is just the one ligament, like what kind of bounce back should we be expecting from Grady Jarrett in 2024? You make a good point. It's reported as an ACL, but it depends on what the other associated injuries are. Uh, all ACLs are not created equal. The associated meniscus damage, other ligaments, cartilage damage, et cetera, make a difference in the recovery and rehab. And that is an unknown. And so the other thing that is harder, it is 
uh, harder for players to recover from an ACL that are speed, quickness, and work in space. And to some extent, a defensive guy always has to react, and that makes it mm -hmm. a little bit harder than an offensive lineman that knows where they're going when the play starts. I've always said, for example, uh, it's easier for a wide receiver to recover from an ACL than a DB because the DB has to react to what's happening, where the wide receiver can, to some shape and form extent, dictate what's happening. And so Grady Jarrett, um, you know, do I think he'll play this next season? Probably. Do I think he's going to have his best season? Maybe not, especially not the first half of the season. And, you know, it's not, it would, would not be unheard of for a PUP stint at the beginning to let him get going. Interesting. Okay. So because like, unlike Kirk Cousins injury, you think that this could linger into the start of the season before he, he's really ready to come back. And that's just because of the nature of the injury, the ACL? I, 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 nature of the injury and the type of player that he is. And I don't think you can s compare ACLs to ACLs or Achilles to Achilles. They're different players. They're different injuries True. and different styles. And uh, I would be pleasantly surprised if G Grady Jarrett looked like Grady Jarrett week one. Well, I... Uh... I hope he does, but I will be, you know, keep that in the back of my mind and maybe tamper down expectations to start the season. Um, but you have exceeded all of my expectations on this podcast, Dr. Chow. So again, thank you so much for joining me. Y'all can find him on Twitter at ProFootballDoc. You can, of course, check out SixScore.com. Anything else before I let you go? No, I talked a lot. Sorry for... <laughs> <laughs> no, it was all excellent information. And again, I really, really appreciate your time. All right. Thanks, Will. All right. Thank you guys so much for listening or watching today's episode, which as always was presented by Bet Online. I really hope you enjoyed uh, the different conversation that I had with Dr. Chow uh, on Kirk Cousins' injury. Going to continue to kind of do some interesting things like that over the coming weeks and months now that you know we've got the draft, but it's the offseason in full swing. So going to find a way to switch it up. But again, I hope you guys liked this episode. If you didn't, or if you did, let us know. Believe in Falcons at gmail.com. Shoot us an email. That's all I've got for you guys today. I will see you next time. But until then, everybody, take care. <laughs>